God is good. And all the time. Good afternoon, everyone. Please, let's pray. Father in heaven, we've come to the end of a very long day. But we believe a blessed day. We have heard your word. We have fellowshiped. We've eaten spiritual and physical food, dear God. And now we end the day with some more spiritual bread. I ask in the name of Jesus, dear God. When I say the name of Jesus, Father, I mean the authority of Jesus Christ. I mean the name of the one who said, let there be light. And the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. In the name of the one who defeated Satan, hell, death, the sin, and the grave. In the name of Christ who is equal with yourself, Father. Bless us with the presence of your spirit. Let him guide our minds, dear God. And let my burden be to glorify your name through the truth. Amen. I humble myself before you. I seek no praise, no honor, no glory, God. Amen. Let my joy be watching you get the glory. Amen. Now surround this place with angels that excel in strength. A very special blessing on our sister who's not an Adventist, but she's here and we ask you to bless her life, dear God. Now, Father, thank you for the high honor of speaking for you. Help me to do it well. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say amen and amen. Our subject, the blame game. What did I say? Genesis 2, reading from verse 16. I'll try to release you as soon as I can. It's 25 to 8. I'll release you. Let's try for 8.15. Roughly 45 minutes. Well, you know, temperance in all things, including <laughs> preaching. And when you've spoken three times in a day, you tend to get a little tired. And it's still hot. That's why my answers during the panel session were short. I was hot. All right, what book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? Read with me without looking. Now, I said without looking. Some are used to looking. Never disobey a preacher when he's in a pulpit. Disobey him at his house, not in a pulpit. Because he's not asking you to sin. Now, do not look in your Bibles. Say this passage with me. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Thank you. Pause. Let's listen to that verse again this time. We shall listen microscopically as I inform the cameraman that I'm moving. And I welcome those joining us via the internet. We appreciate your faithfulness. Thank you very much. Wherever you are, we see you with the eye of faith. Listen again to God's word. And the Lord God suggested to the man. It's the very first use of the word command anywhere in the Bible. And the word command or commanded appears three times before Adam is thrown out of the garden. Genesis 2 verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, we learn from that, among other things, God does not ambush people. If you don't know, God does not judge you. Come on, say amen for grace. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at. If I had not come and spoken unto you, spoken unto them, they had not had sin. When you genuinely don't know, God passes no judgment. But to say to God, I don't know, you must be able to say two things. I did not know, and I had no way of knowing. Two things. I didn't know, I had no way of knowing. That is ignorance in God's eyes. Now, God gave Adam and Eve information. At the time he spoke, it was only Adam because Eve had not yet been made which places a significant burden on leaders of the homes and the churches, men. God is placed in a position to learn from him and pass it on. Can you say amen? amen? It does not remove from our sisters the responsibility to study, but it certainly places upon the man a burden of leadership to make sure your family is informed. 
whether the family is in your house or in the church. So Adam knew and finally Eve knew. God said, leave this tree alone. All the others are available to you. Not only the trees in the garden. Trees all over the earth. Because God gave dominion over how much of the earth? The whole earth. So Adam could go anywhere on earth and eat the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He had to live it alone. Let me, by the way, show you what a good God God is. God could have said, Adam, every tree is mine except one. Just one is yours. Now that would have been tough. But God said, no. I'll take one. All the rest, finish my words, are yours. Say amen for good God. God said, listen, I made seven days. I could take six and give you one to do what you have to do. But no, I'm too good for that. I will take one. You take, come on, six. And just give me one. And God still doesn't get it. God says, you've got $100, I can take 90 Actually, I can take the whole thing. But I'm too nice. Love you too much. I'll just take 10 Out of the 90 you show me how much you love me. And the lifestyle center. <laughs> now, when the Bible says, for the Lord is good, what do you say? Ah, that's weak, weak. What's wrong with you? I said God is good. Yes, he is. I love God. He's a nice fellow. I love him. Long to see God. Look in his face while I prostrate myself at his feet and say, I don't deserve to be here. But thank you for letting me be here. And so God gave Adam information. With that information, God gave him a choice. Listen, you can either live through obedience or disobey and die. God does not complicate anything. You obey, you live. You disobey, you die. You don't need a degree in Hebrew. Now, God bless all Hebrew scholars. Don't misunderstand me. If you're one, God bless you. But you don't need a degree in Hebrew, Aramaic, Akkadian, Greek, or Patois. <laughs> it's too clear. Ellen White says the ABCs of the gospel, well, the gospel elements are simple as A, B, C. Now, let's go to chapter 3, verse 1. Our subject is what? The blame game. Chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 1, reading from 1. When you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let me pause and digress. From then until now, even before then, the devil has always pre presented sin attractively. If you are selling a product, how you package it will affect your sales. Are you following me? Many years ago, well... When I'm planes flying, which is all the time, in the seat pocket in front of you, particularly on international flights, there are magazines. You look at the back of the magazine, there are all the alcohol and the cigarettes. Have you observed the shapes of the alcohol bottles? If you fly, the styles, how artistic they are. Beautiful things. They look like works of art you can put on your shelf. But it's just cancer or cirrhosis of the liver in a beautiful bottle. Have you ever seen a cigarette box? Not black and white with skull and bones. Mm -mm. Nice color scheme. Mm -hmm. You see it and you believe you're one step closer to heaven. But what's in that box? Cancer of the tongue, cancer of the mouth, cancer of the throat, brown teeth, all kinds of things. But beautifully packaged. 
Listen to the devil. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, another way to say that, in the day ye sin thereof, because God said don't eat. So if you eat, you sinned. Is everybody with me? So the devil might have said in the day you sin, but he can't say that because in advertising, language is important. So when you sell exercise equipment, it has to be easy, fun, free, and quick. <laughs> Are you with me? All exercise equipment, they're pre 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 presented as easy, fun, quick. And a free trial, as long as you give me a credit card number. A free trial. Now, so the devil chooses his words. In the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes. But what did God say? You'll die. The devil said, your eyes shall be open. Come on, ye shall be as God's knowing, good and evil. A list of benefits that come from sin. Up to today, people believe that. If you take drugs, you'll be cool. All the girls will go for you. If you have six and seven girlfriends, all the guys will consider you the leader of the pack. If you run around with men, the other girls will consider you, ah, she's the top whatever. Up to today, sin is presented attractively. And so people smoke cigarettes with uh, these little things. You know. There's a certain way to hold it. <laughs> have you ever seen people drinking wine? You don't just grab, a, you grab the glass through here. And what do you do? You spin the glass. Are you with me? Then you take it, you're running around in your mouth. You run around the cirrhosis of the liver in your mouth. And you, then you chown it. And it looks so chic. Huh? You go and do it. Or you take a cigar. Not everyone smokes a cigar. You're from the hood. You don't smoke a cigar. You've got to have money. And you unwrap it. Then there's a thing you sell to cut off the top. Are you with me? You snip the top off. And there's cigarette cases made of silver. Mm -hmm. You take it from the box, you put it in a cigarette case made of silver or gold. What is it? Cancer in a silver box. <laughs> and most people fall for that. And so the devil said, God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, verse 6, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, let me digress again. Listen to the verse. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, did God say eat from it? No. If God says don't eat it, it is not good for food. But when you parley with the devil, he will change your conception so completely that what you used to see as black, you now see as white. Even while looking at black. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, let me digress again. In Genesis 2 verse 9, just listen, the Bible says, And out of the ground may the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight. God knows that beauty ap appeals to the eye. God arranged for beauty to appeal to the eye. So every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, meaning food should look good. Come on, say amen more loudly. Than that. If you serve me something that looks like mud, even though it's good for me, I don't want it. You know, I just don't want it. It has no aesthetic appeal. Now, you serve me something that will kill me then tomorrow, but it looks good. I want seconds. <laughs> and so the Bible says every tree that's pleasant to the sight, but like anything else, we can go too far. And so verse 6 says, and when a woman saw that the tree was good for food. No, it was too good by that time in her eyesight, which was contaminated by the devil. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. Yes, it was. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her. And what a tragedy. You know, in uh, Ephesians 5, 22, husband, no, wives, submit yourself unto your husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. That's the husband. As Christ is the savior of the body, the church, the husband on earth is the savior of the body, the wife and his family. If Adam had acted as a savior of the body, he would have said, Eve, I love you beyond measure. 
but I love God more. Now, God is a loving God. He's a forgiving God. I will go and talk to God for you. Okay, let's try to fix this without offending. I will go and God forgives. We don't know what God would have done. He could have forgiven her because Ellen White writes, if Satan had repented, Christ would have forgiven him and restored him to his position. So why would he do that for Satan and not for Eve? Amen. But I'm just saying, are you with me? But Adam said, nah. Adam said, okay, well, we're one family. We have to stick together. Do you know how many women leave the church because the husband left? And families have to stick together. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? My husband won't go. You go. God may use your faithfulness to bring him back. You never follow sin. No matter who is sin, your mother, your father, your husband, your boyfriend, your ex-husband, you never follow sin. So Adam said, okay, Eve, I can't do without you, which he could, but uh, let me sin with you. All right. Verse 7, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, where art thou? Verse 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. Notice, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. Finish the verse, and I hid myself. No one can hide you from God. I hid myself, meaning Eve hid herself. And he said, who told you that I was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Listen to verse 12. You read it for me. Man said, the woman whom thou givest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did it. Let me point out some of the effects of sin. One effect that was immediate, a couple effects. One, the urge to avoid God took over immediately. Are you with me? The urge to avoid God, it took over immediately after sin. Verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. Let's look at another immediate effect of sin. Go to chapter 2. Let's read verse 25. Our subject, the blame game. Yes, Genesis 2, 25. What does the Bible say? And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. This is before sin. Listen to verse 12. Not verse 12. Um, to verse uh, 12, yes. No, 10. I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked. So now we have shame and fear, which began immediately. But for the purpose of this message, here's something else that began immediately. Listen to verse 12. And the man said, finish it for me. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did it. What happened immediately? The tendency to blame. Mm-hmm. It's one of the most terrible effects of sin. The sinner will not accept responsibility. That happens automatically. You get into an accident, immediately it's the other guy's fault. It's your, and my instinctive reaction is his fault. The woman whom thou givest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Verse 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Finish the verse. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now we have two sinners, one male, one female, the entire population of the world. Am I telling the truth? Yes. And the entire population played the blame game. Not me, it's him. Not me, it's her. This tendency to transfer responsibility, therapists call this transference. I'm no therapist, but uh, here's how it works. A simple explanation. Let's say I have a problem, emotional, I go to a therapist. I have a father who always rejected me. Are you following me? All right. I go to the therapist. 
And in order to start the, the session well, I bring him a little gift, maybe her, let's say a lollipop. And the therapist says, no, thank you. How do I interpret that? Rejection. And I go off on the therapist. Are you following me? But in my mind, who am I really going off on? My father. But he's not present, so I take it out on the therapist. That's called transference. Now, I want you to go, because I want to let you go early. Go to 1 John chapter 5. Let us see transference. Let us see the blame game in action. 1 John 5, we'll read from verse 2. God is good. And all the time. God bless those of you who came from outside and you stayed all day. God bless you for that. I mean it genuinely. What book did I say? 1 John. What chapter? 5. Reading from what verse? 2. Read with me. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Now, listen to verse 3 carefully. Read with me. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Come on. And his commandments are not grievous. Now, let us go to Jeremiah 17. Looking at the blame game, a natural tendency of every fallen person, blame someone else for my catastrophe, take credit for everything that's good. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, you should say it without looking, but you may look. Are you ready? Read it with me. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, let us stay in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. Quickly, quickly, from chapter 17, back it up to chapter 13, verse 23. Our subject, the blame game, five minutes to eight. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Since I accept that beautiful musical rebuke. All right. <laughs> Jeremiah 13, verse 23, when you've got to say amen. Read with me, can the Ethiopian change his skin? What's the answer? No. Or the leopard his spots? No. Then may he also what? Do good, come on, that are accustomed to do evil. In other words, you can't do it. Verse 9 of chapter 17, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Meaning no human being can know the depth of wickedness possible to him or her. No human, only God. Let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Read verse 7 and verse 8 of Romans 8. Do you have that? Romans chapter 8, verse 7 and verse 8. Read with me. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. What have we learned about the carnal heart? It is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. It cannot change its behavior. We learn that it is an enmity against God. That's the condition of the heart. Go to Romans 7. Romans 7. Let's read verse 12. Romans 7, verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good. The Bible says the law of God is holy, just, and good. Go to verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So the law, the Bible says, is spiritual, it's holy, it's just, it's good. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Verse 172. All right. Psalm 119. Verse 172. Sister, since you said amen so loudly, maybe you can read the verse. Are we ready? Read with me. What does it say? My tongue shall speak of thy, for all thy commandments are righteousness. So the commandments are righteousness, they're spiritual, they're holy, they're just, they're good. 
Go to verse 151. Verse 151. Read it with me. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments. Uh -huh. So it's righteousness, holy, just, good, spiritual truth. Go to Romans 7. Romans 7, our subject, the blame game. I cannot tell you the time I was rebuked. So you have to look for yourselves. <laughs> Romans chapter 7. Let's read verse 7. Do you have that? Read with me. What does it say? No, not 7. Verse 10. Verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. In other words, the commandment is ordained to life. Mm -hmm. It's righteous, holy, good, just. Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. It is life. All these things, that's the law. Let's describe the human heart again. It is wicked. It's deceitful. It hates God. It can't do anything that's good. Now, here's what we have. Here's the human heart. No good. Are you with me? Here's the law. All good. God says, you got to live by this. The human heart says, well, I've got a problem. It's too hard. So what I'm going to do is accuse the law of being hard and not good so that the law has to be changed to suit me. Are you following me? You see, one or the other has to change. Are you following me? Here's the carnal nature. We've read the description. Here's the law. This is north and south. One has to change. You know, the Bible says in Amos 3 verse 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Here's God. Here am I. For us to walk together, one of us has to change. But the Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. So what the carnal nature has done, it has said, the law is too hard. <laughs> the law is too hard for us. Change it. Weaken it. Lower it. The basketball rim is 10 feet. I can't dunk. Bring it down. Don't bring me up. Bring it down. And so ministers get into the pulpits and say the law is done away with. I heard Creflo Dollar say that. <laughs> Adventist ministers don't say it so bluntly, but when they say we believe in love, then they're saying the same thing. We want love, not law. Give us love. They're saying the same thing. Hmm. Listen to me carefully. Can't tell you the time. I'm under law. <laughs> we blame the law for what really belongs to us. Jesus Christ came to say, I can't change the law, but I can change you. Now, if I change you, keeping the law will be a piece of cake. Because that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Mm -hmm. A spiritual person loves spiritual things. You can always tell a spiritual church, or one that's not, plan a basketball game, see how many come. Then plan a Bible study, see how many come. Let me give you a, plan a concert, see how many people come. Plan a Bible study, see how many come. Ask them, how many love Jesus? Everybody puts up two hands. Now listen to the Bible as it puts the hard heart of man in his place. Go back to 1 John 5. Let's read verse 3 and see how we make God a liar. 1 John 5, reading verse 3. Our subject, the blame game. It is a natural function of the carnal mind to blame someone else. Do you have 1 John 5, 3? Read with me. What does the Bible say? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Now, the Greek word grievous means heavy and burdensome, tough. Now, 
The Bible says God can't lie. Listen to what the Bible says about the law. It is not hard. The problem is my heart is hard. But so I blame the law. So I can look good. Are you with me? We blame the law. Keeping the Sabbath is not hard if your heart has been changed. Because keeping the Sabbath is the natural behavior of a converted man or woman. I say again, not, as natural as sin is to the carnal nature, obedience is natural to the spiritual nature. The law is not hard. It's not hard to obey the law that says thou shalt not commit adultery. Am I totally surrendered to God? Is my life unreservedly given to him? Last day events, page 191, paragraph 5. God will accept nothing less than unreserved surrender. Most of us, our surrender is 95%. Now that's impressive on an exam. Not in the light of the cross. Because you have to tell me who controls the 5%. And God does not divide the throne of your heart. He said the devil has a loose. Mm -mm. Now, if God does not sit alone, he cannot save you. But the devil doesn't need 95% of you. He just wants 0. 0.0000001. Are you with me? That's all he needs. Look at what Adam did. I told you that. He plucked fruit. A brother told me it was an apple. Okay, fine. And bitten to it. That's all. The devil doesn't need all of your life. He has other things to do. It is God who needs all of your life. The devil just needs a little of you to destroy you. You see, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. The kingdom of Satan is also like a grain of mustard seed. You take a little devil into you and leave it there, you'll go straight to hell. Did you hear what I said? I said it too quickly. You take a mustard seed of hell into your life, it'll destroy you. If you don't confess it and put it away. So when you say, I fast twice a week, I give tithes at all that I possess, and I'm a vegan, and I, I read all of Ellen White's books, uh, but I have this secret thing, I, I, I like to read romance novels. With God. It is all or nothing. With the devil, just give me some. A little. And I'll be grateful. With God, it is all or nothing. My brothers and sisters, listen to God through John. The law, the commandments are not grievous. If your life is 100% surrendered to God, you can stop smoking. If my life is entirely surrendered to God, I can stop going to porn sites. If my life is entirely surrendered to God, I can stop participating in online gambling. Now, different people have different struggles, but the key thing for everyone is a complete surrender of the life to God. Because God who cannot lie says, the commandments are not grievous. The carnal heart says, the law is hard. Because it engages in the blame game, placing the hardness where it does not belong. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my what? Is easy, and my burden is... The yoke is the law of God. Easy. When you've come to Christ, and every atom of you is surrendered to Christ. And you say, how do you do that? You just say, Father, here's my life. And you mean it. Tonight, why are your children disobedient? Don't blame them. Blame yourself. They weren't born 20 years old. They were born this big. 
you let them grow that big rebellious. And now blaming the AY department for not providing good programs. Why did you lose your health? Maybe we followed unhealthy practices. Then we blame whomever, Wendy's or McDonald's for having bad burgers. You know, why did I do bad in school? The teacher was hard. No, you were lazy. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you get that job? Well, why were you fired? The boss is mean. No, you came to work late every day. Let's admit, we're no good in the flesh. You know what Paul says? I know this, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth what? No good thing. Listen to Jesus. The spirit, um, uh, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth what? Nothing. Nothing. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Outside of God, there's no good in us at all. If we have an urge to do what's right, that urge was planted in us from outside. Every urge to do right comes from God. Even if it's done by a satanic person. Because the carnal mind, the flesh, cannot produce a righteous urge. So tonight, let us all apologize to God for blaming others, blaming your wife for the broken marriage, blaming your husband, blaming the teacher, blaming your boss, blaming the general conference, blaming the pastor for not preaching good sermons and you don't study the Bible. You know, we, we, let's stop blaming people and say, Lord, I come to you in painful honesty. I did not spend enough time with my children. I was busy building a career. Lord, I'm coming to you honestly. I did not manage my eating habits. That's probably why I have the condition I have. Now, when you live in a sinful world, things happen. Don't misunderstand. But most of the problems we encounter, we bring on ourselves. I say to God, Father, help me to take all the blame for every problem in my life. Not my mother, not my father, not the presidents I've lived under, not the GC presidents I've lived under, not my community. I am responsible for my problems. And I ask God publicly, give me the heart of Jesus. Give me the mind of Christ. Make me fully his, so that obeying his law becomes my highest joy. Do you know obedience is a joy for the genuinely converted person? And so whether you're 60, 70, 90, 14, or 13, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, applies to you. And so the death of Christ also applies to you. How many will say with me, Lord, I take responsibility for my sin. Forgive me for blaming others. Receive me now as I surrender my life fully into your hands. May I see your right hand? Do you mean that? Stand up, let's pray. I surrender my life fully into your hands. I take responsibility for my sins and I leave you to take responsibility for my salvation. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, what can we say to you? You already read our hearts. You know it before we say it. Lord, we're no good. And I say it with respect. As I place myself at the head of the pack. We're no good. Were it not for Christ's day, God, we'd be dirt somewhere. Decomposing somewhere. But Lord, because of your mercy, you have shielded us from the wrecking ball of death. To give us one more day to get it right. The problem is not your standard. It is us. 
And so we apologize, Father, for blaming you for every catastrophe in our lives. Forgive us, Lord, for blaming other people. Let us set about the task of trying to get ourselves right with you. We spend so much time trying to get someone else right. And getting other people right is not a spiritual gift. Let us focus on getting us right. Maybe if we were right, we'd inspire others to get right. Now, God, bless your people whom you love. Zechariah 2 verse 8, He that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. As corrupt as we are, we are the apple of your eye. We want to live up to that, Father. Right now, give us an infusion, an injection of your spirit of grace, the spirit of life, the spirit of holiness, Father. Make us spiritual beings. Give us a love for the things of heaven. And hatred for the things of the world, dear God. Do that, Father, because we cannot do it for ourselves. Standing before me and you, dear God, are people with tremendous struggles that they keep to themselves. And Father, you respect privacy. I'm asking you, God, go to that person quietly, privately, and remind him of what you said to Abraham in Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And that person, I'm sure, will say to you, Father, no, it's not, Father. Then, Lord, in a partnership between you and that person, begin the work of victory, Father. Now, Lord, extend your elastic arms and wrap them around every one of us, dear God. Pull us so tightly to your bosom that we will have no room to wriggle out. Father, let us leave this place knowing God loves me. Jesus loves me. The Holy Ghost loves me. The angels love me, Father. Thank you for this goodness of yours. Thank you for this camp meeting. Watch over us tonight, God, with a smile on your face. If we have family members outside of the faith, do everything in your power through the ministry of the Holy Ghost to bring them in the path of right before the ark's door is closed. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen.